welcome or welcome back if you've been here before to my channel where we discuss often overlooked stories from history. Today we are looking at Lascarina Bubalina, the Lady of the Revolution. A legend and a household name in Greece, but sadly little known outside her home country. Bubalina's life has become the stuff of legends. Inspiring songs, movies, books, her image has appeared on money, stamps, you get the picture. She's a big deal. But why? Well, on March 21st, 1821, the first revolutionary flag of the Greek War of Independence was raised by Lascarina Bubalina. At the time, she was standing on her 33-metre-long warship, the Agamemnon, while its 18 cannons fired in salute. Not bad for a twice-widowed mother of seven. But this wasn't all she did to seal her name to history and become an emblem of the indomitable Greek spirit and the rebirth of a nation. She was some woman regardless, and she lived some life. Bubalina's start was as unusual as the rest of her life. She was born on the 11th of May, 1771, in a Constantinople prison cell, while her mother was visiting her father. Her father, a ship's captain, had been imprisoned for his part in the Orlaf Revolution, and that's where he died shortly after her birth. Though originally from Idra, she moved to the island of Spetses after her mother remarried. Always having a passion for the sea, it was probably no surprise when she married not one, but two ship's captains, both of whom died fighting Barbary pirates, and both of whom left her sizable amounts of money. And so, at the age of 40, in 1811, history finds Bubalina a rich woman with a comfortable life. And so she could have stayed. Seriously, she had a lot of money. She was set. But she must have bored easily, because she took that money, increased it through trade and successful partnerships, and eventually commissioned four ships of her own to be built. But trouble was on the horizon. In 1816, the Turkish authorities, looking to cash in on Bubalina's success, tried to confiscate her fortune. They stated that it was due to her second husband's participation in the Russian-Turco War. Not only had he participated on the side of Russia, but he was also highly decorated and given the title of captain of the Russian Navy afterwards. Bubalina, of course not willing to give up her fortune without a fight, sailed in her ship, the Corizos, from Spetses to Constantinople and demanded an interview with the Russian ambassador asking for Russian protection. She was granted it in the offer of asylum in the Crimea, but before she left, she also arranged an interview with the Valida Sultana, the mother of the Sultan, in which she explained her situation and implored the Sultana to intervene on her behalf. This would prove a very shrewd move and limited her stay in the Crimea to just three months before Sultan Mahmud, under the influence of his mother, issued a royal decree protecting Bubalina and her fortune. In return, Bubalina is said to have promised the Sultana if ever a Turkish woman asked her for help, she would never refuse. And this was a pledge she was going to live to fulfill. And so she returned to Spetches, but she didn't forgive or forget the Turkish threat to her and her country. At some stage, she made contact with the Feliki Etaria, the Society of Friends, a secret organization set up in 1814 with the aim to prepare the Greeks for the coming war of independence. Bubalina was one of very few female members. She is often incorrectly cited as the only female member, which is not true. There were others. One notable female member was Mado Mavroyenus, who was an influential woman and an influential player in the War of Independence, and is probably deserving of her own video. But let's continue with Bubalina. It is not clear when she joined the Society of Friends, but it could have happened on a subsequent visit to Constantinople in 1819, as it was upon her return that she began building the Agamemnon, which would become the biggest warship under Greek control at the time. 
After joining, Bubalina started her preparations for the revolution in earnest. Many Turkish officials were bribed as she stockpiled guns and ammunition. The Agamemnon was finished in 1820 and received its 18 cannons. If revolution was coming, she was going to be prepared. By 1821, her now five ships were manned and she had amassed a small army of Spetsis men armed and ready to fight when the word came. Well, they didn't have to wait long. On April 3rd, 1821, the Spetsis Navy, made up of mostly merchant ships, became the first naval force to enter the revolution. And Bubalina was right there in the thick of them, commanding a small fleet of eight vessels. Their destination? Naflion. Naflio was considered impregnable by many. It was protected by three forts, Bortsi, Akronaflia, and Palamidi, and had 300 cannons. And it would not fall to the Greeks for 18 months on the 30th of November, 1822. But Bubalina didn't wait around and hope it would fall. Now her fleet, of course, took part in the siege of Naflio, but they also attacked Monemvasia and captured its fortress. They blockaded Pylos and brought supplies to the Greeks. She lost her eldest son in battle at Argos. She became friends and then family through the marriage of their children with General Theodoros Kolokotronis, who was the, one of the most prominent figures of the Greek War of Independence. And she was considered an equal with the other generals when planning strategy. She witnessed the fall of Tripoli and the massacre that followed. Tripoli was the capital of Peloponnese and as such was the headquarters of the Turkish. After three days and three nights of battle, it fell and most of the population died in the aftermath. 25,000 bodies littered the streets. But Bubalina, remembering her promise to the Sultana, protected all of the women of the Pashim's harem after his wife had asked her for help. After Naflio fell and the war ended, Bubalina settled there as it had now become the capital of the new Greek state. She was granted houses by the new Greek government. That was until the Greeks broke into fractions and civil war broke out. She was arrested twice before finally being expelled and heading back to Spetses. She had depleted most of her fortune fighting in the war and was bitter with the Greek politicians, whom she saw squandering their freedom by fighting amongst themselves. On May 22nd, 1825, not one year after returning to Spetses, Bubalina died, but she didn't die on a beach or at a helm of one of her ships, and she didn't die from the rifle of an enemy. She died on her balcony in Spetses from a Greek bullet shot from a Greek gun. She was having a dispute with a local family after her son had eloped to one of their daughters. Her killer was never identified. It was a tragic end to a formidable woman. For her actions during the revolution, Bubalina became a national hero and the story of her life became the stuff of legends, both at home and abroad. She is still remembered and revered nearly 200 years after her death. Emperor Alexander I of Russia posthumously gave Bubalina the honorary rank of Admiral of the Russian Navy, perhaps making her the first woman in history to hold the title. She was also one of the first few women to play a major part in a national revolution. Without her ships, herself and her lion heart, who knows if Greece would have even gained their independence. But perhaps her greatest achievement is the inspiration she gave her country. A common woman born in a prison, in many ways the same as everyone else, a mother and a wife, but whose strength of character and through perseverance and belief helped break the chains of those who came after her. <laughs>